Greetings. I'm Dr. Sharon Mulvey, the director of the Women's Heart Clinic at Mayo Clinic. And today on theheart.org, we'll be discussing aspirin and primary prevention with my colleague, Dr. Francisco Lopez, who is the director of preventive cardiology. Welcome, Francisco. Thank you. The FDA this past May, as you well know, issued a public health advisory announcing that an evidence review showed no support for the general use of aspirin for primary prevention of myocardial infarction or stroke. Coincident with that, the agency informed Bayer Healthcare that it had rejected its application to allow for the marketing of aspirin for primary prevention of heart attacks. The agency stated that the current evidence for primary prevention of heart attacks was not strong enough to outweigh the bleeding risks. It's really great to have you here, an expert in this area, to discuss further with us your thoughts on that. What is the evidence base? Well, Sharon, thank you for um, um, addressing that because it was very interesting to see that the FDA uh, issues that particular statement when the American Heart Association, the American College of Cardiology, and pretty much any other major medical organization has uh, endorsed the use of aspirin for primary prevention. Now, it was unfortunate not to see the evidence that was um, uh, based on, but uh, when we review the evidence uh, of all the clinical trials testing this question, I can see where the FDA is coming from and also why they issued this recommendation. But I think there is a, an important uh, message for clinicians that, uh, that we can share. Uh, the evidence uh, supporting the use of aspirin for primary prevention comes primarily from uh, three major clinical trials, but in general there are about nine clinical trials testing that question. And the summary of the evidence is that um, aspirin can indeed prevent myocardial infarction. The benefit seems to be modest and it has no effect on total mortality or cardiovascular mortality. In women, however, the benefit seems to be limited to stroke. And the risk for bleeding, particularly gastrointestinal bleeding, is also real. And it almost goes one to one with the number of events that is intended to prevent, cardiovascular events. So that's why um, this issue is controversial and that's why uh, the benefit or risk um, is, is gonna be a source of uh, major uh, discussion. It's a real conundrum. I mean, every day we face the situation with our patients, whether or not they should have aspirin. I mean, they ask us these questions. They have been quite confused by the media releases just over the last month. How do you deal with this in your office? What, what are you doing? Like there is this evidence base, is that meta-analysis that you've just referred to. There are the major trials that we have. And the bottom line is that it does seem that there is really no convincing evidence for reduction of cardiovascular death or overall death, but certainly the reduction of non-fatal MIs there at the expense perhaps of the increased risk in bleeding. But we have to individualize. And how do you do this with your patient? Sure, so first of all, I try to assess the patient that certainly doesn't need aspirin. And that's generally the young individual or the person with no risk factors who, is, who has a very healthy lifestyle and the risk for cardiovascular events is so low that aspirin is clearly not justified. I think that's the, the very first step that I take. After that, after I identified a patient that might benefit, then I go over the evidence and highlight the modest but real evidence to prevent myocardial infarction. And I also go over the evidence showing that um, there is no major effect on, on mortality or cardiovascular mortality. And then I try to uh, exercise the shared decision making with the patient so they are part of the discussion. And if they are okay, taking a, an aspirin every day for, for X number of years to get a modest benefit, and they are okay with that, I think that's, that's a patient's decision, and, uh, and I think that's fine. Uh, I also assess the risk for uh, gastrointestinal problems. If they have history of ulcers, particularly uh, bleeding from the gastrointestinal tract, uh, in the last few years, I will be um, more resistant to start aspirin. Uh, in patients who have tolerated aspirin in the past and qualify for that, I will not uh, stop the aspirin, of course. And, and, and it's, it's usually a decision between the risk for bleeding and, and the potential benefit they might have. 
So if they have significant associated risk factors, diabetes, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, uh, obesity, and if their overall risk score, for example, on the HA pooled cohort score, comes over a certain threshold, 7.5%, 10%, is that how you approach it? Do you then say your risk is such and such? And in this situation, we know that there may be some benefit, but there also sure. is a significant risk for bleeding. I will say uh, I, I base my decision in part using the global score. However, uh, uh, one of the issues that let the FDA issue that statement was actually the fact that there are three clinical trials, uh, recent clinical trials, that show no benefit in patients with diabetes and or peripheral vascular disease. So using just uh, single uh, risk markers, uh, it doesn't seem to help much. I think is is perhaps the patient that has uh, several other risk factors, not just uh, not just diabetes. And, and, and the one that has very minimal or very low risk for uh, bleeding. So again, uh, I think this issue just brought uh, some uh, additional dis discussion to the table and, and we probably need more evidence to have a more conclusive and clear uh, guidance in when and how to start the aspirin. It's a very good point, and I do think there are several trials actually going on at the current time looking at prospective use of uh, primary prevention with aspirin. So um, if you've made the decision with your patient that you think that the, the risks outweigh um, the, um, any risk from the risk of bleeding, and so the benefit would be uh, greater with use of uh, aspirin, the big question is what's the dose? The trials, uh, you know, they're all, all over the map there. So, so what do you recommend to your patients yeah, for excellent. primary prevention? That, that's an, a, an excellent point because for some reason we got fixated to the 81 milligrams, uh, even though the doses uh, tested in clinical trials went from, from uh, anything from 75 milligrams to five mi 500 milligrams a day. Um, I go for what the minimal dose that can block the effect of the uh, uh, platelets that could be at the same time perhaps the safest and uh, to prevent uh, bleeding. And I go with 81 milligrams. And uh, I don't think there is any evidence showing that higher doses are better. So uh, indeed the, a the HOT trial used 75 milligrams um, a day and that has been perhaps the most uh, significant study across all patients uh, groups that uh, show some benefit. I think that's a really, really important thing because patients are quite confused, but it's easy to get at least the baby size. So that's the simple approach is a baby aspirin is what you would recommend on a daily basis yeah. if indeed the risk justifies it for having cardiovascular disease. And I think it's very important to emphasize again that this is for primary prevention. Those patients that already have an established diagnosis of heart disease, that's secondary prevention. And indeed, they all should be on aspirin unless there's some significant contraindication. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. Yeah. I think that's, uh, that's something else that uh, patients got to be very careful not to uh, mix those uh, messages yeah. and get confused because those who had a history of myocardial infarction of uh, any sort of uh, atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, they should definitely be on aspirin. No question about exactly. that. Exactly. And even though we think of primary prevention and secondary prevention is very different, there really is a continuum. And that's where the tricky part is. And that's where we need prospective trials to really sort those issues out. Yeah. I think it's well worth mentioning too that cardiovascular lifestyle prevention, the standard things that we recommend with appropriate diet and physical activity, that's for free, that's no risk. And that is something that we always emphasize to our patients and those that are confused about aspirin, you always can be very supportive and very strongly recommending the optimal lifestyle issues. And yeah, absolutely, absolutely, yeah. absolutely that, that. Um, aspirin cannot replace exercise and nutrition. Bingo. Yeah. So Francisco, it's really been a pleasure to have you with us today and thank you for sharing your insights on this pretty you know, controversial, vexing and confusing topic. We thank our viewers and we hope that you will continue to check out our future content on the Mayo Clinic's page at theheart.org on Medscape. Thank you.